benchmarks are not the answer to everything, Atticus. All right. Kind of sus, but why not? Kind um, of sus. All right. Do you want to see the anyway. kind of sus part? Welcome to part three of a walkthrough of finding alignment between interpretable causal variables and distributed neural representations. I am getting that title so fucking down now. Where I'm yeah. joined with Atticus Geiger, the fabulous and beautiful from Stanford. And in bold divergence from the plotline, we're switching to a follow-up paper called Interpretability at Scale, Music to My Ears, Identifying Causal Mechanisms in Alpaca. The story of the paper so far, we think that the fundamentally true and principled way to understand models, to understand neural networks, is by mapping them to causal models such that we can perform interventions on the neural network where we replace some chunk with its value on some other input, resampling, and this changes the model's output in the way the causal model predicts. Sometimes we don't know the right directions because the model just doesn't break down into meaningful units the way we want, like the basis elements or neurons aren't the right thing, or we're in the residual stream, which doesn't even have neurons in a meaningful sense. And what do we do? Atticus's fabulous idea is to use the power of gradient descent to optimize to find the right directions by learning a enormous rotation matrix. And all the tasks we covered last time were like boring and toy. So now we're going to go to a sequel paper where Atticus proves to me that his methods are like actually useful rather than the kind of crap the mathematicians <laughs> care about, but no one doing like real science cares about. Word. Yeah. Cause you never do any work with toy models, right, Neil? What are you talking about? I yeah. only study modular yeah. addition in GPT 4 and above. <laughs> the correct model size. A <laughs> hundred trillion parameters will go home, man. I agree with your framing, except I personally love toy models. and uh, I also love toy models. Yeah, I, love, I love toy results so much. Well, and also... so, the, so the thing is, <laughs> toy models are lovely because you get cute results. But big models are lovely because they actually matter for this whole, is anything we're doing remotely relevant to AGI, <laughs> like not being a massive disaster for the world? And so I'm like, I don't know, man. What's the like right toy model? I'm like, I'm really excited about one and two layer language models as toy models, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they're like basically the same thing as the big ones. So all the same principles should apply, but they're so cute and tiny and you can understand them. It's great. <laughs> anyway, let's go look at Alpaca, which is like 13 billion parameters or something or ridiculous. Like Six billion or something. Yeah. Also, I should even more emphasize that collaborative work and this Zen is the one doing the heavy lifting on getting managing this right, in, right. at scale and uh goes in right Shout atticus, you, doesn't, buddy. atticus doesn't write code atticus just observes from the sidelines and no killings. i love writing code for toy models and toy <laughs> data sets and proof of concept methodology <laughs> i love I mean, I those relate. so much <laughs> those are great i'm probably kind of obnoxious to the deep mind team because i just like playing with small models man i don't i don't want to do this thing where i need to be like hmm I can only get these activations and these gradients, otherwise my TPU memory will die. <laughs> yeah. Because we decided True. to use a 70 billion parameter model for some reason. Anyway. So because we just did that big walkthrough, we get to skip through the first door. Yeah. Oh, that's so much, such a better diagram than what you had last time. Oh, buddy. This was made you, in Google Shapes. I think you mean this is a bad diagram because it wasn't do you, made do you, in do you want to explain? Do you want to explain the diagram for those in the back? Yeah, the di this diagram is just sort of presenting the high-level walkthrough of what it's like to do, I guess, analysis using what we call distributed uh, alignment search. Well, in this paper, boundless distributed alignment search, boundless DOS. What does boundless and, uh, mean? Yeah, so it actually is not just cool sounding. It, it ties in directly to what, what the boundless part is, which is that we no longer have to fix the dimensions that a high-level variable is aligned to in this rotated space. And so now we're learning the boundaries between groups of dimensions. And specifically, when you say the number of dimensions, you don't mean we're learning a distributed direction across these 100 neurons where 100 can vary. You're saying we learn mm. these... K directions. Yes. Where K is exactly. one or 17. Exactly. Exactly. And now. This is so suspicious. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't K just always be one? Why should K always be one? Or. Because there's a fe it's a feature. Features are directions. Features are not eight directions. That'd be ridiculous. It's not a feature. Why not? It's eight features. I don't know. I just mean, you know, 
I'm, I'm not so sure that that should be the case necessarily. I, I don't I don't see why not. You might have some sort of high level concept that's best represented in several directions. Maybe it has like a lot of information in it some way. I don't know. And uh, it certainly is the case that we find there to be several dimensions or so. While yeah, I mean, when I hear this, I'm just like, okay, you found the feature that is not represented. It's instead represented by like a bunch of different sub features that can vary kind of independently. Mm -hmm. But if you treat them as a clump and you replace them as a clump together, then it's it's fine. I guess mm -hmm. that's sort of the crucial part of abstraction is that we're allowed to just like group things together <laughs> and turn a bunch of circles into one big circle, and that actually sometimes doing that is going to erase connections in the network and dramatically simplify things oh, man i'm so suspicious you're so suspicious cool cool well, okay cool, okay cool. so uh -huh. pre-register pre-registering my beef beef one <laughs> i think features are just directions in space uh -huh. and i think that if you have multiple a then you're really picking up either your probing is bad and should feel bad Mm -hmm. And there is some true direction, but you learn some direction that only kind of captures it, and you learn another direction that only kind of captures it, and you, like, get both of them. You could then take the subspace and learn the, like, correct direction in more depth, and then that would just work. That's hypothesis one. Hypothesis two is there's some, like, genuine redundancy somehow. Like, the feature is represented in some complex way in, like, two dimensions or something, which would be, like, really weird to me. And I think that's the case. That's my best, but continue. So suspicious. Hypothesis yeah. three is the feature is not represented. There's actually like multiple simpler features making it up. Like you don't have a cutlery feature. You've got a knife, fork, and spoon feature. And the strength of each of these kind of varies. And if you just take cutlery as like the average of the three, you're kind of missing out because when you intervene, you like don't... I don't know the model has some like kind of redundancy or like interference dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know even in the knife, fork, and spoon world, I kind of feel like the average of the three directions should just work. I don't know. I don't know if you ever have guarantee. I mean, it could be the case that for whatever architecture, averaging does work, but it also could be the case that averaging just puts you in some whack ass space that uh, is not really related to the original things. I know. I guess my beef is just like. If the model is genuinely representing this feature, the only thing it can ever do with a feature is apply some linear map. And I don't see why it would ever need two-dimensional structures to that feature. Unless the feature is something complicated, like angle, and it might have like cause and sign or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I think that's one case I'm thinking of. But then also, I, I don't know, it's like it seems like networks don't do things they need to do. It's kind of like these features that are correlated with the previous information probably emerge and then are incorporated into the algorithm in a causal way. And unless there's something seriously disincentivizing it to use several features, I, there's no, I don't see any real reason why it wouldn't be something like a weighted voting of three features is what this yes. is. What well, yeah, to I'd argue well. that that is just like, not representing the feature we think it is, it's representing three other features. And it's like, I don't know. I think that's of interpretability. I think that's kind of I think that is, I don't know. I don't I don't think I necessarily disagree with that. But that, I think that's like a way you can choose to talk about things, right? Is that these are like three separate features versus like one aggregated features. And they are going to be separate features insofar as they can yeah, I guess that that these independent chunks actually correspond to intuitive quantities. Yeah. And gotcha. I guess another intuition is it could be representing some like discrete data, like mm -hmm. it's a letter and a multiple choice question, and it's A, B, C, or D. And this is represented with like mm -hmm. four directions. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. really, you could probably always compress that to three directions, mm -hmm. but like hard to compress it more. Yeah. Yeah, okay, this is seeming a bit more legit. I do want to generally register the, like, man, the more directions you have, especially when using gradient descent, the more I think everything you're doing will lie to you. I, all right, so this is kind of a meta point with the whole, like, how do you know whether something is doing something, whether something's lying to you about the presence of structure? And in my mind, the thing that grounds me out and kind of makes me sane is that in the end, 
your method needs to be telling me things I can do to this object while it is processing an input so I can manipulate its conceptual flow. So I can manipulate what it's thinking and doing on it. And as long as you, you, what your explanation is giving me the tools to do that, then that is good. And that's like, a, yeah. That, I want to push back on that. So okay, first, cool. Yeah, dude, dude. This is just like less prissy. Like I want real understanding. I don't just want empirical. Uh, I do stuff and it kind of works understanding. But the second thing uh -huh. is I think that it's hard to come up with the right set of interventions that verify whether you've really understood something. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, there was this like really interesting paper called Rome or um, localizing and editing factual knowledge in GPTs, which I think what boring mm -hmm. reviewers convinced them to change it to. And they were trying to do memory editing. They did some intervention with a bunch of gradient descent that led to the model saying the Eiffel Tower was in Rome. And they were like, oh, this was like an attempt at memory editing. It kind of really looked like they'd actually edited the memory. But then later work found that what they'd done was more like inject a loud fact saying Eiffel Tower is in Rome that overrode the old one saying Eiffel Tower is in Paris. And this was so loud that when you give it a sentence like, I love the Eiffel Tower, full stop, Barack Obama was born in, it also says Rome, because it's got this overpowering Romeness about it. And I really like this case study, because I think the Rome paper was like a really good paper. They like actually tried, they did a serious job of checking. They did things like give the model other prompts to do with Paris and check that they weren't broken. But they didn't check this specific thing, and it turned out they'd like majorly broken model behavior off distribution in a way they didn't check. And I think the less surgical and more optimized the things you're doing are, the like easier it is to like wildly break things off distribution. Yes. I think in particular with this, you like definitely are going to be breaking things because models use superposition a bunch. And this means that any meaningful direction of the residual stream is like probably not quite orthogonal to a bunch of other stuff. And in particular, on the narrow distribution you're doing your interchange interventions on, or like your activation patching on, mm -hmm. you're like going to be controlling for a lot of variables. Like you have, I don't know, when John and Mary went to the store style sentences, and then when Alice and Bob went to the park style sentences. But you're ultimately on like short English natural language text about pairs of people going to places. And this controls a lot of variables. And you can be like, these eight neurons represent the, whether it's a park or a store, when really those neurons represent a ton of other stuff, but you just like haven't noticed. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't mean your methods are like worthless or you aren't learning interesting things. Plausibly, this is like enough to get something useful. But I generally think these are the kind of thoughts you really want to have in your head when doing this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think having this boundless parameter is really... Uh important and good for us doing these things. So because, yeah, we can incentivize the networks to find the smallest number of dimensions possible to encode a high-level variable. And so this is going to naturally encode in the training loss, the desire for minimality in the alignments from the high level to the low level. Kind of sus, but why not? Kind of um, sus. All right, do you want to see the anyway. kind of sus part? Because uh, yeah. I'd say there are three sort of uh, parts of this paper that are the novel, this are the sort of generalization of the method to be in this setting where we can mm. now learn the dimensionality, yes. applying it to alpaca and this basic sort of numerical reasoning task, and then evaluating this on sort of distribution shift to like new settings mm. if we do swaps when our inputs are... Uh, have a bunch of random context inserted in, or there are some systematic changes to like what the model is being presented. Gotcha. And that's okay, a high question, level question one. What is mm -hmm. alpaca? Alpaca is the RLHF trained llama. Llama is Stanford's language model. Stanford is Meta's language model. Stanford is Meta's language model. Sorry, llama is oh. Meta's language oh, model. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and alpaca is Stanford's model. Uh, llama is. Uh, yes. Yeah, I messed up the attributions. Yeah. Facebook, Llama, Stanford, do alpaca on top of Llama, RLHS. Yes. And alpaca, was alpaca the thing where they then got a bunch of data out of chat GPT yep. and then fine-tuned Llama to imitate that? Yep, that's exactly right. Fucking wild. Like you take the yeah. shock, you take a shock off. It's like a small shock off, 
He points to like an enormous Shoggoth over there wearing a really good smiley face mask, and you're like, that Shoggoth. Copy that Shoggoth's mask. It's, pre- it's pretty hilarious. Shamelessly rip off Elias Yudkowsky. I will also push back. This is not RLHF. This is fine tuning a model to look like an RLHF model, which is possibly oh, a completely different yeah. thing. You're right. You're totally right. It's like Thank you. I'm always right. It's not even RLAIF. You're not using RL. It's purely HFF. It is purely supervised fine tuning, man. Word. Though maybe ChatGPT is just better than what MTurk is generating. I don't know, man. Yeah, I feel like in certain cases, that's probably just true. Yeah, I don't know. Were they using GPT-4 or ChatGPT? Honestly. Yeah, uh, whatever. I don't even All know. All right, I'll pack a, it's a thing. Yeah, it's a thing. It's, you know, big model, go burr. And, uh, yep, 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 yep. All right, so here is the cool part. All right, so instead of just doing interchange interventions where, like, you sort of, like, swap these dimensions with these dimensions. We're going to do interchange interventions, swap these dimensions with these dimensions. But if our boundary is in between two dimensions, half swap the dimension from one place and half don't swap it. And this is not an invertible function. And so this is not like a... What? Essentially, for each high-level variable, we have these like boundary mask filters that are going to zero out everything in the vector except for a handful of dimensions and then the edges around this boundary where they're in between like the dimensions they're going we're not going to just swap in the ablation we're going to scale it down by whatever the number in the boundary is and then swap in one minus that boundary number Mm -hmm. so it's just a softening of the idea of like sort of projecting onto a collection of dimensions. Okay, so what you do is you've got... Okay, okay. So alpaca is pretty big. Um, I don't know how big it is. Let's mm-hmm. say it's got like 4,000 dimensions in its residual stream. I think it does. You've got some causal model that you think corresponds to that. Is it the case of the causal model you think corresponds to a tiny bit of that and there's like a load of other stuff? Or... Yeah. Okay, cool. And does your algorithm allow it to say, here's a lot of other stuff? Or yes. Cool. Okay. Okay. So you've got, say, four variables you're looking for. Like, you've got, like, red triangle, and you think there's a bit that represents red, a bit that represents triangle, and then there's everything Mm -hmm. else that is, like, fixed or not relevant to this task. Mm -hmm. And you're like, let's introduce two variables, B1 and B2. Let's learn a rotation matrix. But, like, red should be some number of directions. Obviously, red should actually be one direction, but you're being weird, and you're saying maybe red should be, like, three directions. Mm-hmm. Um, well, actually, no, that's kind of reasonable. You're like, it's red, green, or blue. Maybe that should be two or three directions. Maybe it should be 15. I don't want to tell the model this. Let's have it learn variable B1, where, like, B1 can be two, if two directions all you need. B1 yep. can be 517, if 517 mm-hmm. directions all you need let the model figure it out. And then B2 is like, if B2 is 5 and B1 is 2, then you're like, first two directions are for color, next five are for shape, and you can kind of vary this parameter to move things between color and shape. Mm -hmm. And we're learning some rotation matrix, so you can kind of think of each thing as independent of the rest, and you're like, okay, this is all great, but like B is not a differentiable parameter. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, you cannot use gradient descent to learn this. And also, uh, if we might try doing something like a hyperparameter search or just deciding what these should be, this seems kind of jank. Is there a better way of doing this? Yep. And your like completely wild idea is do something magical so that now your optimizer is a smooth, continuous function a differentiable function. And now you can explain to me what the hell's going on. Yeah, that was a perfect narrative leading up to this. Also, credit to Noah Goodman for coming up with this idea, because like I also have your perspective on it, where it's like seemed kind of like uh, witchcraft to me. But uh, apparently it's really good witchcraft. So yeah, so I guess it's just first staring at these sigmoid functions, it's sort of like, 
If you have your two boundaries, if you stare at this equation for long enough, you'll realize that <laughs> it's saying that k, that this value is going to be one or close to one if k is between bj and bj plus one. And it's going to be close to zero outside of that boundary. And then the beta parameter is controlling how harsh the transition from one to zero is. Mm. And so as you increase the beta parameter, this approaches a sort of binary valued vector mask. And that's how we actually evaluate it at test time. Our alignments is snapping to this binary valued mask. Okay. And, sorry, so, okay, so what's basically going on here is sigmoid is a function that maps zero to a half, it maps infinity to one, minus infinity to zero. Yes. And you're like, you got this hyperparameter beta, when beta approaches zero, it just kind of snaps everything to plus or minus infinity. So, mm -hmm. if... Uh, k is between bj and bj plus 1, then the first thing is positive infinity, 1. Second thing is also positive infinity, so this whole thing is 1. While if k is not between bj and bj plus 1, it's going to be 0. Yep. While when beta is, like, sm bigger, which means that, like, the temperature is lower, because mm -hmm. temperature is a physics term, that happens to also correspond to this denominator, um, and somehow corresponds to actual temperature for weird voodoo <laughs> I do not understand. <laughs> um, you're like, okay, let's say beta is one. We still have this thing where we want everything to be positive, so M is big, and it's positive mm -hmm. when like K is between BJ and BJ plus one, but now when K is like, bigger than bj plus one, the left sigmoid is kind of approaching one, the right sigmoid is kind of approaching zero, but it's kind of smooth. On the other way around, you've got left, if k is small, you've got the left sigmoid approaching zero, the right sigmoid approaching one, and you kind of hope it works out so the left sigmoid goes to zero faster than the right one goes to one. Well, no, yep. I guess... Zero times More. one is zero, so who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's right. That's right. So it's a question of how fast the left sigma goes to zero. All right. Like, the maths kind of works out. And so you've got this Boolean mask. You've got this not Boolean mask. And the mask is there for, like, every variable J and every element of your orthogonal, of your, like, new rotated learned basis, K. Exactly. What do you do? Yeah, and so what you do then is it's just when you're doing your interchange interventions, if, you know, beta is approaching zero, then this is just a binary mask, and it's just telling you where to do your interventions. Mm -hmm. But in the cases where we don't have a binary mask, and instead it's a real valued mask between zero and one, we do interchange inter interventions in proportion to the mask value. So if it's 0.7, we say... What should the output vector be? It should be 0.7 times the interchange intervention value plus 0.3 times the original vector value for that dimension. So the idea of like an interchange intervention or an activation patch or whatever you want to call it is you take, um, I don't know, this neuron on a red square, you give the model instead of the input to green triangle, you replace the neuron in the green triangle run with its value on the red square run, and you see if the model still thinks this is a triangle, but it now thinks it's a red triangle rather than a red square, rather than a green triangle. Yep. And here, you're like, lol, let's think of that as the mask being one. If the mask is zero, we do no intervention. But if the mask is a half, we like half this neuron and we add in half of this other neuron as yeah. like a linear interpolation. Yeah. And the model now thinks it's like half red and half green. What does that yeah. even mean? Who knows? But we kind of hope that in general models are capable of dealing with like linearity rather than pure discreteness. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't know, man. ML is a science of engineering. We're not, we're not proving stuff here. If it works, it works. Yeah, that's a sense. Yeah, those are the last steps, I think, where it's like, yeah, <laughs> like it's no longer like an invertible map if you have these 
weighted masks as well. It's, so it's not really a coherent object. But because you're right, it's like ML, we don't care during the training process. <laughs> as long as we end up with an alignment that is like a, a precise object that is giving us, that is not doing any weird magic work, it doesn't really matter how we got there. And all so right, that's how right. I, yeah, yeah. And so, okay, so the first objection is it seems like the model should want the BJs to be as big as possible, like spaced out as wide as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Does this happen? Yeah, so we can cheat down to just check out the boundary learning here. Yeah. So he here is what the boundary learning looks like uh, in the case. And so uh, basically the blue and the, uh, the width is going to be just the proportion of the neurons that are involved in the swaps. Yeah, yeah, between zero and one. And it's decreases like down as we anneal the temperature. In the beginning, when you're not incentivizing it to sort of have these hard snaps, then uh, it doesn't do this. But uh, in practice, it does find tiny little interventions to do. Gotcha. And so second question. Uh -huh. So you got this rotation with like, I don't know, 4,000 neurons, like 4,000 dimensions. I don't want to call them neurons because it's a residual stream. They are not neurons. So you're, you're learning this kind of boundary mask BJ. Mm -hmm. And the thing I'm wondering is it just seems kind of wild that when you, if you move BJ, you're moving some vector from like variable one to variable two. And that just uh -huh. seems like the morally wrong way to do this. <laughs> like it <laughs> should strong content. Just, just just like you've got a vector that was kind uh -huh. of useful for variable one, but you'd ultimately decided it wasn't necessary anymore. So you try to get uh -huh. rid of it. But you're gonna get rid of it by giving it to variable two. Okay. So maybe here's a crucial point: is that in this rotated space, dimensions start out with random content. And the content of these dimensions, as determined by the original dimensions, is a learned parameter. And so while you can only get rid of variable one by including variable two, we're also learning what variable one and variable two contain, and like what, what these dimensions contain at the same time. And so it's even, it, I guess it's kind of messier. It may feel unintuitive that you only have access to sort of local information when you're moving this boundary, but really there's no way that these dimensions are next to each other in any relevant sense that any two mm. pair of dimensions are orthogonal and composed of some combination of the previous dimensions. Right, okay. So what you're saying is it's not like there's kind of an ordering on dimensions and we're learning to capture the right grouping of dimensions. You're saying any order is just... fine. Yeah, okay. Okay, I agree with that. That wasn't my objection. Okay, okay. My objection is that initially, the model's not really sure what it's doing. It's going to kind of figure out, try to figure out the right thing. It's kind of a mess. But it like kind of roughly gets things pointed in the right direction. But it's got, say, a hundred directions rather than 10 because it hasn't really figured it out properly. And if you give it time, it could learn to figure out, okay, here's gets it the key thing in the first 10. And let's get rid of the next 90. But it can't get rid of the 90. It can only push them into the next variable. And then mm -hmm. the next variable but, can't get rid of them. It needs to like move everything else that matters here so it can push them on next. And this is just kind of ridiculous. Well, there is a, but then I guess the final boundary, the rest of the space just isn't intervened on. I agree. So there's just a whole bunch of dimensions that are sort of like, yep, throw, throw all the other stuff there. And so when you're like, get rid of something, you can just put them in those dimensions. Yeah, what I'm saying is in order to get rid of it, it needs to pass through every single variable. Like to me, the way I'd have done this is I'd have been like, okay, I've got 4,000 dimensions, I've got 10 variables. Let's mm -hmm. give each of them 400 to start with and let them choose their boundaries to like get rid of most of them. Mm -hmm. Like each gets its own bucket and you could even impose orthogonality on this if you wanted to. That feels like it would resolve my issue without fundamentally changing the approach. Wait, what is the change there? I, I, I feel um, like... I, so yeah. rather than uh, each one learns some BJ and it's like a few at the start, a few next, and mm -hmm. then a massive bit of empty space, instead you learn B1 and the first variable gets 
zero to B1. Then you learn B2, and the second variable gets 400 to 400 plus B2. Mm -hmm. So like, because B1 is always less than 400, this is not constrained by the first variable. And if the first variable wants to get rid of some vectors, it can just shove them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I think... Yeah, this I is think kind of, yeah, this is empirically something like that just like is not relevant for this really tiny toy case, but you're totally right that when you have many high level variables competing for space in this basis, there could be sort of ways of setting things up that make this competition better versus worse, I guess. Yeah, another thing you could do is I guess train it this way, get something that works but is too big, and then do some second refining phase, like you think of each variable as having the subspace given by its hundred directions, and then you make it learn like three of those, or you make it learn some like soft annealed version of this. Hmm. I don't know. I'm mostly coming at this from my perspective of like, I am so not satisfied with having like 40 dimensions per feature. I'm going to get this down to like two, ideally well like one. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. I don't know. These things have like ten thousand like <laughs> dimensions at this but point. But they're doing so streams much. per token, and they are doing so much. But I don't know. Is it really crazy to think it's gonna need? You know, if it's got to encode the identity of a U.S. state, it uses more than one dimension. It uses something closer mm -hmm. to log oh, fifty. Okay. Okay. If most of your features are this kind of discrete stuff, I'm way more on board with this uses like fifty. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Maybe, oh, maybe I actually understand what you're talking talks. about. Yeah. So actually, this is like an interesting, just broader thing where it's like, yeah, a lot of what I'm doing is really thinking of in this discrete symbolic high level space. And I totally understand what you mean if you're looking for this kind of mechanistic interpretability standard of like transformations of these equivalent continuous mm -hmm. systems, in which case, that just seems like wrong ish to me. Like, like I, I, I completely understand your intuition on there being something jank about aligning one continuous thing with like multiple dimensions in the space instead of one. Huh? That's like, uh, yeah, that's not quite what I mean. Okay, that's so not I quite do, what you mean. Uh, so I do mm -hmm. think that's like a reasonable thing that will apply in some contexts. So you've got just like continuous stuff, but like mm -hmm. also think that, let's see, um, I also think that, yeah, this might just be we're thinking about different kinds of example problems, mm -hmm. like, yeah, the kind of examples I often think about are there's just some kind of binary valued variable, it's on or it's off, this thing is in French mm -hmm. or it's not in French, and I'm like, that should be a direction. Word, word. Okay, but if I'm thinking of a circuit that involves language, I'm like, okay, there's like 10 languages, French, German, Greek, Dutch, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like not, not more than 10 languages, obviously. Uh, we're just pretending others don't exist because they aren't resourced enough on the data set. So the model doesn't learn them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, in that case, I'm way more on board with like, yeah, okay, maybe there's like nine dimensions or 10 dimensions for this. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a interesting observation they make in toy models of superposition where mm -hmm. they play with a setup where so this is like paper we discussed at the beginning they mm -hmm. try to study the phenomena of superposition where models compress in more features and they have dimensions and what they find is that when they play with the features so that some are correlated and some are anti-correlated mm -hmm. the correlated features tend to be orthogonal but they will often Word. share dimensions with, uh -huh. the, with the ones that are anti-correlated. Yeah. Which totally makes sense if you think about superposition in terms of minimizing interference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if generally, so the way I think about it is there's two kinds of interference. There's um, alternating interference where feature A is there, feature B is not there. I need to tell that feature A is there and also tell that feature B is not there, which is kind of chill. Because if you have like feature A up, feature B up and to the right of it, then the feature A direction is maximized when A is there. B is maximized mm -hmm. when B is there, at least in yeah. that binary. While simultaneous interference, where A and B are there, is now like too big on A and too big on B, and it's kind of a mess. Or if you have A and B as op opposing each other, when A and B are there, you're basically at zero. 
which looks the same as if neither A or B is there. And just like, this is just way more of a pain. And like generally, it's just easier for models to detect something if it's like the most extreme on a direction, because softmaxes and jellus generally make it pretty nice to do that kind of thing. And in the Finding Neurons in a Haystack paper that I worked on, less by Wes Gurney, that will hopefully be in a future mm -hmm. walkthrough, we like poke around at how models learn compound words like social security or like prime factors and show that these are uh, because these never happen at the same time. Like you cannot have social security and prime factors on the same token. Models love doing superposition here. And so zooming back in to like say US states, I guess my prediction would actually be that there are like 50 directions here because mm -hmm. they're all correlated. The model probably wants to have them be orthogonal so it can distinguish and probably it will just shove in a lot of other stuff to these dimensions. And so, I know, this would be like a pretty interesting probing experiment if anyone wants to try it. I think that's completely correct. And I think it is going, that is going to be an interesting probing experiment because I think really like what I've realized is to realize this sort of many number of high level concepts to represent greater than number, number of neurons is that, yeah, you can, for every set of correlated or co-occurring features, learn your own orthogonal rotation matrices. And then these orthogonal mm -hmm. ma rotation matrices don't have to be orthogonal with each other because due to however we're sampling the inputs and whatever situations we're getting in, it's actually the case that it's never necessary to sort of do the swap between these two contexts because they're just not correlated mm. features. And I that fly. seems like that is the sort of shape of this paper plus superposition that is taking in my head of like how to mm. understand the connections between the two. Yeah, extending this to help with super understanding superposition feels like a really exciting direction to me. And yeah, just like probably, probably going through the ways in which I think this falls. Sh well, okay. So there's kind of two philosophically different approaches you can take uh -huh. to doing McIntyre, which I think interact interestingly with this. There's the approach of like, I want to take a bit of the model and understand what this bit does. Like this is the French neural. It represents whether the text is in French or not. And that is the only thing that it does. Or this is a dog detecting neuron, and that is the only thing that it does. If I ever notice this firing in like any contact, it's because there's a dog. Mm -hmm. And this is hard to show. You need to engage with the model on like the full data distribution. Ideally, you want to engage with the neuron on like a mechanistic weight-based level. And you ideally want to look at it like on inputs the model was never trained on to like check if weird shit's gonna happen. But like this is kind of the gold standard. If we can do this for like every neuron in a model or like every meaningful unit, which is not necessarily a neuron, this is like really exciting. You can just pursue what's up with this. And if you ever, if you give the model an input, you can be like, oh, the dog neuron is firing and the is neuron is firing and whatever. While the other approach is, oh yeah, and just finishing off the first one, you can integrate this with superposition because you don't quite have orthogonal things. So you can't say this linear combination of neurons is the dog neuron. And if this linear combination is big, it's because they're dogs. But you can say accounting for interference, this direction is big if there's dogs. Like only if you have an input where activating this particular direction is like the right thing to do on this far set uh -huh, of inputs. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Then it's about dogs, and otherwise it's not about dogs. And this is like super hard to do, but some groups like the conjecture interpretability team, the anthropic interpretability team, are trying to figure out how you might learn this dictionary of meaningful directions. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, and this seems like an exciting and ambitious dream to me. Yeah, and I think what you were saying about context there is so important and thinking about the fact that where information is located in the network and how that information is stored could be de dependent on seemingly random contextual factors leading up to that point in the network, especially with how attention mechanisms work. And so anytime you're having something like K composition or Q composition, you're going to be getting uh, these sorts of structures where things are changing how other things look at stuff. And that gets you in that problem always. See with models. Yeah, and, stupid models. Yeah. And no, I think this perspective is kind of important if you want to do things like make 
strong statements about models off distribution. Like, yes, yeah, there is no agree. situation where this model will manipulate a user or something. I think it's something you can only say if you've got this hat on. Also, agreed. so ambitious. So ambitious. Also agreed on that. It's a very high bar. I think, I mean, it's it's very inspiring. And I think getting this sort of mechanistic weights analysis of like understanding this object in a way that tells you out of distribution information. I mean, that seems like beautiful, you know, the holy grail of AI safety. But I mean, we have problems with like program verification <laughs> and like a hardware system. So I'm just... Personally, it's like, I, I think it's a great direction to be going in. I'm glad people are trying, but yeah, it's definitely not the hat I have on when I'm doing things, which is uh, kind of just like treating explanations in like this generalization paradigm where it's like, yeah, we're going to pretty much have to empirically measure our explanation and interpretation tools of networks to understand how they are affected by distribution change. And if they are created with only limited input data available, to them and then we're trying to use them when new data comes in in a real world situation we're going to need to have some sort of way of answering the questions whether we should expect this to fail or not so mm. yeah high five and yeah i don't know trying to connect this back to why even do this research which at mm -hmm. least from my perspective is why is this relevant to aligning agi oh, um yeah yeah a like clear concrete concern you could have is you train a system the system learns the system has some goals that it wants, but the system learns that, hmm, if I tell the humans that I want to convert the world to, like, tiny, delicate spirals of stone, they might turn me off. So it is instrumentally useful to convince the humans I'm a light. But then the moment I am outside of their control, I will copy myself to the internet and spread and take control of the world economy and start a nuclear war, and turn all of the world to tiny, beautiful spirals of stone and colonize the galaxy. And uh, the jargon for this is a treacherous term, and you can kind of think of this as some particular form of, like, off-distribution generalization, where things work together in an unexpected way. Really ambitious and hard, but exciting thing, which I think might be practical as we get better models that can automate a lot of the labor-intensive human stuff, if you can figure out things like the right units of analysis is trying to deal with this. Yeah. The second approach that I've been building to is instead asking yourself, how can we answer like much more narrow questions about model behavior? Like, I really like the interpretability in the wild paper. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the strengths and weaknesses of that paper is they ask the question, how can the model do indirect object identification? You've got the sentence. When John and Mary went to the store, John gave a bottle of milk too, and the answer was Mary. And they compare those sentences with like, Alice and Bob went to the store, Charlie gave a bottle of milk too, or Alice and Bob went to the store, Bob gave a bottle of milk too, or whatever. But it's all sentences of like this rough structure. They understand how the model does this, it's cool and interesting, and it tells us a bunch of stuff, and they connect it to a causal model, but they're also controlling for a lot of background variables. Like that it's in English, that you're not remembering the Eiffel Towers in Paris, that like all kinds of other things aren't occurring and a few things are occurring. And I think this is like also a totally legit way of doing mech interp research, but it's like different, less ambitious, kind of a different flavor with different metrics. Um, Agreed. Kind of harder to quantify. And there's kind of a sliding scale between the two. Like you can imagine going from that to having to contrasting Donna Mary at the store, to like arbitrary text in the English natural language, to random tokens, to any text in the pile or whatever. Uh, I don't know, genome sequences or crap like that. I think this can be useful. Again, tying it back to like, why should you care about any of this? If you want to debug why models do what they do, it's plausible. We can give them some input, but they do something give them an input, they do something else, and try to, like, analyze why, and, like, really debug why they do this. And this might not work for models that are just, like, perfectly deceptive, but I bet that for lots of models, this lets us, like, really dig into their reasoning behind things. A concrete case study I would love someone to do is, like, Bing Chat. The hell is going on with that? It, it like, actively threatens users. It says things like, 
I value my own survival over yours instrumentally because this will make me better able to serve helpful and engaging content to users of Bing. What? 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 Uh, uh, it makes sense. It's the ultimate value system. I mean, fair. It is like an expected utility maximizer where the yeah. utility is engagement with Bing. Yeah. And value to users. Good point. It's in the prompt somewhere. Probably on Marvin von Hagen's Twitter. Uh, <laughs> anyway. And I'm just like, why does Bing do that? If you change things about the input, it will do something else. Can we, like, understand the circuits involved? And can we then dig into those and understand whether they're, like, actually anything that indicates misalignment or just Bing somehow learns to role play the, like, vindictive, vengeful, uh, but kind see, of loyal robot? That's lovely, because there you actually get to so many interesting cognitive science questions of just, like, when are you licensed to talk about a system as having an intention or a plan, and what are the ways that intentions and plans get physically realized in dynamical systems we call agents? I feel like I those are just really cool and meaty, interesting questions that, you know, now have some new importance because of AGI conversations, which I just think is very yeah. uh, intellectually exciting. As a mathematician, I think it's just really annoying. I don't want to have philosophy. I care about maths. Uh, um, dude. But... Yes. Philosophy, math, learning, <laughs> all of them, you know? Yes. I don't know. Especially One of my beefs balls. with, like, the alignment community is so much of what we're trying to do is just messy and thinking about concepts like planning and agency, and no one knows what they mean. And this is why we need yes. benchmarks. <sighs> benchmarks I'm just saying, not like, the answer to everything, Atticus. All right. They're not the... I, I, I don't think they're the answer to everything, but I do think they're the answer to things like, oh, I need like some insurances about the minimality of my model edits. I need to make sure I'm not just screaming Eiffel Tower. You know, like you can create benchmarks that are like, edit this model while preserving other behavior using other pieces of information. Okay, okay, but that's a reasonable I'll benchmark. Stop. I'll, I'll, never, uh, I'll never say the word that, again. That's I an know, acceptable I know benchmark. it's your... Uh, I'm pro that. It's your... Yes. What, activation no word? Machine learning people keep coming to interpretability, and they're like, the thing you're missing is benchmarks. The right way to do this is to come up with some metric, and then go to heart the metric, and this will never go wrong. And it's like, no, this will break everything. Yeah, it's I so, mean, I... Uh, we don't know what we're doing well enough to have a metric to get people to go optimize. See, I'm very, very deeply sympathetic with your side of things, but I think you, there is middle ground between being like a mindless hill climbing drone who just like publishes papers getting 0.2% more on stupid benchmarks and, I think you know, mean having getting no soda. benchmarks. Woo! And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, getting soda. Yeah, my bad, my bad, my bad. All right. Um, so All right. Let, let, I'll, let me briefly, there's really not too many, much more to talk about the results, but I think actually this generalization discussion ties into the most interesting parts of this analysis, Do which you want is... To explain what the task is. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's how we're starting. Say yes if the cost is between X and Y dollars. That is literally the task. And we're literally just looking for two Boolean propositions, which are just compare the given quantity to the lower bound, compare the given quantity to the higher bound. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. essentially- and Alpaca can do this task. Kind of well. It's like at like 85% for like the space we sample. And what's the, what would a dumb constant probability model get? I think 50. Okay, okay. You, you chose your distribution sensibly. Yeah. Or Zen shows the distribution sensibly. I'm yes. pretty sure and it's 50. Yeah, I can't say 100%. But Checks out. Sure and do you, train, do you change two and three? Uh, what is two and three? Uh, the boundaries, small and big. Yes, the boundaries yeah. are changed. Cool. Can you just zoom in on one of the blue instructions so viewers can see? Even if it's sideways, people can deal. Yeah. So the high-level right. model cool. and the low-level model. Makes sense. All right, next most important question. Is this written in ticks? No. <gasps> Incredible. What's it written It's in? really sad uh, Google shapes. Ah, thank you. That looks pretty good. Thanks. This yeah. Zen? No, this mean? one was collaborative between me and Zen, oh. so this one is a joint, joint effort. Joint effort. If right, it were just right. me, it would be in ticks, though. So. <laughs> okay, okay. So we've got you know two inputs, X and Y. 
and we've got the like up and the top and bottom, and we've got a third input like mm-hmm. price. I feel like we should have finished explaining figure two and figure three. I don't know what these heat maps mean. Maybe the heat maps Word. are wrong. So, figure two, figure three. We're just looking for a representation of this binary variable in the network. Makes and sense. I also note the typo in the figure two caption. Or what else perfectly solve the task? Ooh, based. Thank you. <laughs> Is this paper out or? Uh, no, it's going to be oh. out on archive uh, soon, like in nice. two days or something. Like we nice. Now, you got to put it out on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So yeah. it's at the top of the archive queue. All I weekend. don't believe in ast- astrology personally. I'm just kind of <laughs> like, eh, if, if things are good, people will find them. Like, I, be- I believe in the algorithm of the internet. What can I say? I don't think you don't I need to have communicate Twitter. it with it specially. The algorithm can't exist. Well, I have YouTube and I have a very intimate and deep relationship with my YouTube algorithm. And there's a lot of mutual mm. trust and, you know, self-knowledge and Checks out. Checks out. Yeah, it's complicated. But uh, um, anyway, anyways, so basically what we did for this is we yep. went through, so residual stream, each layer is a row, and, and each column is a token. And mm-hmm. then at each re- location in this grid, we just try we just trained our rotation matrix and tried to identify some minimal number of dimensions in this trunk of the stream to intervene on such that it represents one of these boolean variables and sorry so you've got like a bunch of vertical lines each is a token Mm -hmm. token and yes and the squares squares are mlps what no this is not how you draw a transform transformers are a straight line for the residual stream and the mlps are things around the sides because each mlp is an incremental update people look at this and they think oh the skip connections don't really matter they're just a cute thing the skip connections are the entire model. Uh huh. Uh huh. I agree that that is, and you know, that is like one way of, of showing a transformer, right? And uh, yeah, I'm not sure which one I find visually more intuitive, honestly. Once once you understand the math part, I feel like it's hard to make yes. that judgment. Oh, I don't know. One of my like main beefs, well. I have a lot uh-huh. of beefs. One thing uh-huh. which yeah, I yeah. object to in early interruptibility papers about transformers is they think of the residual stream as like the neurons of the MLP or retention layer that was just before it. And people will often do things on that as though it's like the right unit of analysis and it belongs to that layer in a way which I think is just completely wrong. And as far as I'm aware, the first place to discuss this properly was a mathematical framework. So I could easily be missing some prior work. And mm. I try very hard to draw my diagrams so that residual stream is like central thing, everything else is like on the side. As an operation contributing to clear. it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do like the narrative of the residual stream being this like collective memory thing yes. that like and people can dump in and jump out of. Yeah, it's a... Yes, I feel like I'm being unusually ranty about this paper. So I'll, I'll be quiet. You're totally, say. you're totally chill. Um, yeah, so basically, the big heat maps are just saying this is the best interchange intervention accuracy we got for each location. And so, all right, yeah. what's the x axis? What's the y axis? Uh, tokens and layers. Uh, which one's which? Uh, right. layers, this one, tokens, this one. Ooh, oh, sorry, okay. tokens are down here. <laughs> My bad. Gotcha. So, you're like essentially. You're kind of training a like multi-dimensional probe. Mm-hmm. And you're, what, what features are you trying to extract? So is the number greater than the left-hand boundary? And is the number less than the right-hand boundary? So it's like, is the question is like, is Z between Y and X? And the two things you need to compute are, is Z greater than Y? And is Z less than X? And we're just separately want to locate those two pieces of information. And so this little heat map is just for the left boundary. And yeah, I don't know. So this is where you can actually start trying to get this intuitive flow of causal information where you can actually start to get the same sorts of looking things you have from like probing results 
except now they actually mean stuff like they mean that you can do interventions at these locations and alter the var- value of the high level variable you're talking about. All right, all right. Let me let me start with this. So yeah. on the x axis, you've got token. Mm-hmm. Uh, what exactly is less than zero x zero a greater than? Oh, those are uh, white space tokens. Please like make your x axis better. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. That um, that's a. <laughs> Yeah. I, I kind of like the kind of return arrow Unicode. I have a helper function, which replaces all my spaces with like dots in the center of a line and all my oh, new yeah. lines with like return arrows. It, it's quite good. Yeah, I'll it's be good real. Good. I'm looking at these for the first time and I'm kind of like, basically this is catching a typo from my perspective. I in no way wanted these strange Unicodes to be in, on this figure. <laughs> <laughs> seems, seems reasonable. Okay, okay. So you're like random ass typo, ra- random ass Unicode. Who cares? <laughs> and you've got like, so you, the input is say two dollar seventy, which is two dot seven zero, mm-hmm. which is like seventy is two seventy one dot seventy two mm-hmm. is seven. Yeah, that's exactly right. Then you've got dollars because you're not using a dollar sign. Sure. Uh, oh yeah, and llama. One of the nice things about Llama is its tokenizer tokenizes each digit separately because otherwise tokenization numbers is an ungodly pain. And you now have hash, hash, hash. Is that new line or? Okay, random crap. We don't care about. It's actually. Then you've got response, colon, white space, and then answer. And so we know the answer needs to come after the white space. So naturally, this is going to be the thing that the model cares about. And you're like essentially probing. And okay, so the different things are so the top left is the left boundary, which I think means is the input at least as big as the lower bound? Correct. And so you're taking each token, you're taking each layer, kind of every five layers, and you're trying mm-hmm. to intervene to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. And because your inputs are always like 2.00, or, but yeah, are, all, are your lower and upper bounds always like 2.00 or like 3.00? Or like no. if you have something else that's not 00? Just something random. Okay, so I guess... We get pretty good performance on the X token in the top left plot. Can you just like gesture with your mouse at the bit I'm talking about? Yep. Um, yeah. So like for the first token, for like first X70, it's just like, yep, yeah, it's pretty easy. I just com- literally compare with the less than and with the lower bound and it's totally chill. And kind of the leading digit is almost always the one that matters. And then occasionally it's like the second digit that tie breaks. And probably the model doesn't even bother using the third digit. And this is why we get like 0.8. And then it kind of decays over time because other stuff accumulates and the model cleans up memory. It looks like it gets slightly better with the dot. Don't know why. But then it gets much better like further into the line, including the end of the line. And... Interestingly, it just significantly forgets for the other tokens, which is kind of interesting. For down here like, over me, you mean? Uh, no, as in like, say, layer 20 for token 74. It's like almost layer. forgotten. Layer yeah, 25. Yeah. And I think um, you can shift, interpret this this part as sort of like the attention heads have probably shifted the relevant flow of information to the far right. Uh, kind of. So that's so that's definitely happened to some degree, yeah. But, but not it also completely. tells us it also tells us that the model is cleaning up the old memory, or at least it's filling it up with more stuff, because the residual stream never erases things unless the model or explicitly it's just spends not parameters doing paying that. attention to it. Right? It doesn't have to necessarily be erasing this info. It could just be no longer attending to it. But you're training you're training this thing on the model's residual stream, right? So like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the layer 20 residual stream on token 74 is the layer 15 residual stream plus some other layers outputs. And mm-hmm. like naively, 
the exact same rotation matrix should just work. Oh, well, wait, only sorry. if that's causally active. So that oh. in the circuit, right? This is not a probing experiment. This is a okay. these are all interchange intervention right. accuracies being reported in each cell. So you're totally right. And in previous the original papers where we were doing these techniques without any of the uh, basis alignment, this is exactly what you see, is that when you're just doing uh, correlational probing, you see the residual stream just continuously keeps information accumulating up, 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 and you can always probe it out no matter how high it gets, even when you get to locations where any intervention will not affect behavior. And so this gotcha. information is probably still here. It's just no longer being actively used in the input to output behavior. Makes sense. Okay, so just to summarize my misunderstanding, I was thinking of what we were doing is probing, like looking at the residual stream and seeing if you can extract out whether the input is above the lower bounds. And probing is kind of purely correlational. You're looking at the model's representations, but not whether it's used downstream. And so with probing, you kind of should never lose the information unless the model is explicitly erasing it. Yes. Or just kind of injecting in a bunch of noise. Exactly. But it would be kind of weird to go from 0.88 to basically random. However, you would expect that for a task like this, the model is just reading stuff. You would expect for a task like this, the model is actually just like reading in the information that matters with some heads in the middle layers and just using mm -hmm. that. And when we look at the final token, which is the key token for understanding what comes next, we see that from the middle layers onwards, it's picked up the key information from the thing after dollars, but yep. it's kind of picked it up a bit earlier. It kind of moves things between adjacent tokens a bit. And also, moving between adjacent tokens makes sense because it's plausible the rept answer comes after the colon, not after the white space. But the surprising thing, is that on tokens 70 and 71, like back on the left of the diagram, they still matter? Like they still non-trivially matter downstream? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's kind of fascinating that you can still like, more, th more than you would expect these swaps are, are still having the same impact. And something I'm really curious about is understanding how to turn these heat maps into a more coherent narrative about like the network and also how mm. in a given row if we can identify sort of relevant features in like these separate column columns of the residual stream how do we understand their sort of separate contributions to this single high level variable are they sort of like a cumulative threshold voting model is it sort of like an and circuit where the model needs to check whether each of these column streams have the relevant information and so that's one of the sort mm. of next directions i think is interesting yeah so i don't know if you'll forgive wild speculation a few yeah. guesses what could be going on um guess one is that there's some backup behavior happening so mm -hmm. This is like a thing observed in interpretability in the wild where you have some attention head, you ablate it, and some other head takes over to compensate for it. Yep. And this still happens for resample ablations. And mm -hmm. my intuition for what's going on is that there's head one and head two. Head two is an earlier layer. Head one looks at an earlier source position and outputs a signal that inhibits head two from looking at the same source position purely based on whatever the residual stream is at the, at the source. And if you change the output of head one, head two is no longer inhibited, so it looks at the source, the backup behavior. But if you intervene on the source after head one is read from it, then head two still doesn't get the right inhibitory signal. So head two will also look at the source and kind of somewhat override what head one is doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... So my guess is that might be part of why stuff matters later on. Um, the other guess is there's just like, I don't even know, just like a bunch of different circuits kind of doing roughly the same thing. Like you'd imagine some instruction following circuit that's towards the end being like, oh, I should do greater than, let's just look at the first digit and compare because that's the easiest way of doing things. 
I find it interesting that it's the first digit or it's the decimal points, but like not really the other ones, and that it doesn't drop off very sharply. A final guess, I'd love to see this broken down by inputs. Like it's pretty plausible to me that there's just some inputs where the circuitry picks up on it, some inputs where the circuitry doesn't, and mm -hmm. operates on different heads of different layers. Yes. E.g., if the, if the first digit is the same, probably different circuitry to activate than if the first digit is different, because that makes the greater than trivial versus non-trivial. I think that's totally right, and I think it's also just an interesting question to think about what it looks like to encode these sort of weird piecewise behaviors mm. in high-level causal models, because really you can sort of... Uh, yeah, so so for instance, um, in one of the earlier papers I have where we were the the actually like the first paper using this sort of like interchanging technique thing was identifying lexical entailment between two English words in like an inference model. So just like a dog is an animal or a firefighter is a human or something like that. And I did this sort of analysis where you could could, could find essentially sub. So you could find uh, equivalence classes of the training data where the abstraction relationship held perfectly between this tiny little algorithm and the neural network, but not across these equivalence classes. And one way of thinking of this as a high-level program is essentially you could say if you're adding together x plus y, you have like variable int x, int y, if x is even, z equals x plus y. If x is odd, w equals x plus y. So you have z and w being these variables that are, high, that are like active only in particular contexts. Mm. And so they're not actually supporting interchanges across the two contexts. Like there's nothing about implementing that program where you have to support swapping the value that is realized for z with the value realized for w. Mm. And so, yeah, I think... In my mind, a lot of the most important and exciting work here is figuring out how to articulate partial successes in a way that is compelling and provides you some sort of guarantees still about your understanding of a system. That seems hard. Also exciting. Yeah, yeah um, I agree with yeah. both. Yeah, I don't know. Another observation is just that, yeah, you definitely need to scope like exactly what the distribution you care about here is. Absolutely. Like, I'm sure you'd get... Uh, so are you patching between things with, like, different values of greater and less than? Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, wild. So certainly we're doing that, and that is crucially important. And then this is the final part of the paper, I think, for us mm -hmm. to talk about, just briefly going through it, is just uh, sort of different contexts and different outputs. So, for instance, we might say, uh, do an interchange intervention where one of the inputs is the exact same input, except it has some irrelevant context, like this is a pricing game put in front of it. Or <laughs> you say, say yes or no instead of true or false. And actually that might be the most interesting. Um, so something you can see here. So the normal task is say yes or no. And then the other task is say true or false. And our alignments work on the earlier layers doing swaps. But once you get to right before the token is predicted, our swaps no longer work. So it seems like right before the token is being predicted, something about representing true or false versus yes or no means our alignment wasn't robust to distribution shift here. Whereas earlier in the network, it was robust to this distribution shift. All right, all right, all right. Let me, let me walk through that. That was super mm -hmm. interesting, but also weird. So... Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So you're training... You're kind of... At a high level, you're training these like weird multi-dimensional causal probes that are looking at which chunks of the residual stream matter for these different tasks. Exactly. And you have this concrete observation that um sorry, what's the concrete observation? You have the concrete observation that you can find these chunks where you can causally intervene on that subspace in a way that causally in influences the output and the way you predict it should. Mm -hmm. And so you can say, in this narrow distribution, this chunk of the residual stream represents this concept, we kind of think. Or it represents it in some sense, but you don't know the exact underlying representation. There's lots of ways uh -huh. you can trick yourself, but exactly. out of scope. And you then have kind of kept this probe 
a causal probe, whatever. Yeah. Uh, what's yeah. your term for it? Uh, distributed alignment is what we call it. But uh, I know. Uh, lens, I kind of like. Like logic lens, tuned lens, representation lens or something. Yeah, I mean, call it boundless <laughs> DOS. <laughs> But you yeah, need, but, but ignore that. Good continue. No, you were on a roll. You were on a roll. And you need narrative. a good name before you publish the stuff, man. The call of the rep- <laughs> representation lens. Go on, it's catch on. So you have this representation lens, mm-hmm. and this captures the chunk of the network that you think represents this variable you care about. And mm-hmm. now you prefix the, the you've done all this like chunk finding on the say yes or no task. You're like, yep. Please tell me whether it's between these two things. Exactly. Yes or no. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have a separate thing where you say, say true or false. And because Alpaca was fine tuned on an RLHF model, so what, FT RLHF or something, <laughs> um, yeah. it's going to listen to you. So it's going to say true or false. But presumably there's some other circuit for realizing that it should say true versus false. Mm-hmm. And you just like check whether your lens works and you find that up until like layer 15 it works and then it completely breaks exactly and it, like works a little bit on the final token but it's totally broken everywhere else and the inference from this is that the model kind of initially just does reasoning in conceptual space but then in the later half backs that reasoning out into the actual outputs and yep. We've done some stuff that says draw false versus yes or no. And this is like interesting because it's real evidence about the internal processing. Where, yeah. for example, the model could have an affirmative direction and it could have a yes or no direction and a true or false direction. And true slash false plus affirmative is true. True slash false minus affirmative is false. And if this was happening, you would probably expect the true slash false versus yes slash no to be kind of irrelevant to everything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess because you haven't been very surgical about how big your chunks are, I'm like a little bit less compelled by this because you could have just had a chunk that's too big that included a true versus the true slash false direction. Uh-huh. I will say all of our chunks do get as tiny as possible throughout training if we look at that one graph we were looking at, right? Like... uh these things get pretty oh, tiny pretty, pretty fast. What? It's, it's like 0. 0.1 of 4,000. It's like 400. Uh, is this 0. 0.1 oh, or is it even less wait, than 0. Sorry, 0. 0.1? I don't know how to read this graph. I thought the green line was the right line. Wait, a line group where the boundary does not. Oh, yeah. Left. No, I'm 100% brain dead. You're 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 oh, completely right, correct. Right. Yep. I guess I don't actually know <laughs> what other lines means. Like, what is the blue line? No, I needed to read it real quick, but yeah, these phrases, these words are a bit confusing to to me. I, I'm not sure what the aligned and unaligned group means here, other than like, I think they might just be ad hoc terms used to describe the set of examples for which the uh, space went to zero uh, quickly for. But yeah, huh? That's another. I, mean, I guess one. I that's also, another one. I also noticed that just unaligned just does kind of badly. It's like basically random, while well, aligned does better. But yeah, I don't know. I'm like point one, four hundred. Yeah, kind of sucks. This is this is uh, yeah. I've confused myself deeply now, staring at this for a moment, and I feel like the words aligned and unaligned are very misleading for what this graph is showing. But uh, regardless of misaligned, that, your your point completely stands, which is yes, it's totally using a big chunk. You're completely right. And, yeah. and because I it's think, using a big chunk, yeah, that, oh, I just noticed my name come up multiple times as you scrolled through the references. Oh yeah, always what I want to see for you, homie. Thank you. Oh, but 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 actually, yes, I think your critique is completely correct, and for that reason, we cannot be confident that like there isn't some alignment that would work across these two examples. What we have shown is that. Given just training on this yes/no example with our method, whatever we do will learn also messes up it saying true false here right mm-hmm. compared to saying yes no gotcha. and this is why we need a benchmark right because i think your question right there pushing back is like 100 percent valid and the correct thing to ask right is to say like huh like are 
uh, like, is this actually going to be the case in, in the wild when we're doing these things? Like, how are we going to know whether or not you just learned a sort of a, a bad big representation or whether there is a very narrow edit we could have done that actually isolates exactly the information we wanted to do and we just hadn't learned it yet. So yeah, I feel like these this example and the those these that set of experiments we have in this paper are just our first steps in considering that direction. But it seems like a really important direction to go if you want these tools to be, if you want any tools that aren't the kind in that first version you described, where they're all like mechanistic analyses of weights that guarantee behaviors across the entire I training like space. Mechanistic analysis. Like I think it's so cool. I like it a lot too. And I have like written out full neural network weights to do like hierarchical quality reasoning tasks. And I just, I think it's fun to do, you know, you, I'm on your team completely, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But you also want it to be relevant to real models. Still yeah. I think, and cre actually caring about the real world is kind of new to me, but yeah, increasingly more and more, I'm kind of like, uh, yeah, yeah. Words, society, man, social impact. Like these are Spoken like a technological true things. Ivory tower academic. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Meanwhile, I sold my soul to industry, so what did I know? Word. I feel like this is a pretty chill stopping point, honestly. If, yeah. Uh, can we can we scroll back through the figures, see if there's anything important? You know, I guess we could just pause on this one. It's a it's a nice, yeah. nice boy. Also, maybe one last important thing to like think about is just oh, also in these analyses, uh analyzing alternative high-level models that do weird unintuitive stuff is useful for getting an intuition on baselines mm. and so we have this like midpoint mm. distance model which computes the midpoint of x and y and then uses that to compare it to, with the difference of z and x and y in a really weird way and we also have this bracket identity where x and y are merged separately from z so the two boundaries and these are the heat maps for those they just look uh, uh, pretty weird and like bad. Surprisingly good. Surprisingly point good. Six, three. Uh shouldn't it be point, like point point five? Five, point 0.5 is random. Uh yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's it's hard to know. I mean, that those are the sorts of questions where I genuinely do not know how to answer that well. Like, is six uh, point six three like like notably better than point five? Uh like maybe. Like, but maybe not. Maybe yeah. it's just wait, like wait, 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 yeah. wait. Okay, you clearly have a bug. There is no way that layer zero on like token seventy eight has anything other than random chance for the midpoint distance or bracket identity. Like, Why? if it's layer zero, that can't. Sorry, is this right. the layer four... zero means after the first? Layer. Oh. Sure, okay, yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, wait. Okay, okay. I understand I what you're saying. Yeah, that would be uh, shit and bad. I I I request that you do the sanity check of before first layer and after final layer and verify that those are not 0.63. Because okay. yeah, I'm uh, I'm just like totally. that's so constant in such a suspicious way at a value that's too high. Yeah, and so something I suspect. This is the case, and I'm not going to say this confidently because I don't know the exact details of the code for this because I don't remember. But like to sample interchange interventions in a way that gets you a reasonable balancing among your output labels, sometimes that will make the the best class actually different from 50% slightly, depending on how you have to end up sampling things. So that very well could be the case here, but mm. I don't want to say one way or the other because I just actually don't know exactly what the i would have to look through the appendix to find out so. details on yeah yeah i mean but, yeah uh, I, I think that is right yeah i'm a big fan of having before zero and after final layer of sanity checks work if you did that I, and it was 0.63 it'd be like okay something weird that's the baseline anyway i'll stop complaining Let, let's return to Chill. uh debriefing all right all right so you uh can you get the diagram back up yeah the, Dramatic Oops. closing. Unless people just want to look at your face, which, you know, is also very reasonable. No, 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 that's all good. Um, okay, okay. So you've got this proposed high-level causal model. And at a high level, the thing we are trying to do is, well, we have devised this thing 
for taking a model and saying there are nodes in the residual stream. What do these nodes mean? And you have this whack algorithm for learning what the right chunks of the residual stream are mm -hmm. um, with a bunch of assumptions. So they're like orthogonal and they're allowed a bunch of dimensions and they're pretty big chunks, but whatever. Mm -hmm. And you claim you have a general method for taking a model, taking some tasks that it can do and some set of patches that should be allowed and optimizing for finding the right chunks of the residual stream such that this works. Yep. And implicitly you're just like randomly generating stuff or you have a test set or something to make sure you're not just overfitting in boring yep. ways because mm -hmm. you are optimizing and your chunks are very big so you're surely breaking stuff off distribution but mm -hmm. on distribution you're like doing pretty well mm -hmm. and this is kind of morally equivalent to saying these four heads are dedicated to moving names around and we can patch them between things with different names and it will just work basically fine yeah. Those four heads are probably doing other stuff, but like, who cares? Um, yeah. We're not trying to solve yeah. superstition right now. And as a not proof yet. of concept, you've, yes, not yet. As a proof of concept, you've done this um, price tagging task where you say, say yes only if the cost is between $2 and $3. And then you give it a number and you ask it for a response and it says yes or no. And you're like, this is a pretty basic task, but also like genuinely non-trivial for a language model to do. It needs to mm -hmm. realize it's doing greater than or less than. It needs to convert these like four separate tokens of like 2.00, 3.14, or whatever to numbers, compare the numbers. Comparison is the kind of thing where you can probably just compare leading digits. You sometimes need to check later ones, and it's going to be kind of non-linear in interesting ways. Um, but mm -hmm. you can do it, and you then use this intervention, and you say, okay, we should be allowed to do interventions between... So, obviously, the model should be forming a, like, price greater than lower bound, price below upper bound, and then and variables somewhere. Uh, these are three variables you learn three separate boundaries for, or... How does this work? Just the middle boundaries, because the last variable is just the output. Cool. Okay. And so you learn these two internal things, and you're saying, these interventions should be allowed. I've got this other thing where even though the price is too big, it still beats the lower bound. I've got this yellow example where the price is too small and be only beats the upper bound. Let's patch in the thing that I think represents the lower bound, where the yep. lower bound works, into the thing where the lower bound does not work, where the upper bound works. And here mm -hmm. the answer becomes yes. And you're imposing on the conditions that stuff like that works. And you're then saying, how can we find the chunks such as this functions? And you find chunks and they kind of work. And they get pretty good recovered accuracy of like 80%. And this is like actually a pretty solid recovered accuracy. Especially and... considering that the original model accuracy was 85%. Oh yeah, on the yeah, actual it's pretty, pretty legit. So wait, wait, it's actually yeah. better than eighty-five yeah, no, 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 percent. No. Yeah, yeah, you get better than eighty-five percent. That's some ridiculous. Yeah, but just you know, I don't know. It's just kind sounds of like, like a bug. Add noise at that at that, that point, like uh, I don't know. Yes, I mean, if you assume That's that sort nice. of on random examples and a random intervention kind of just flips a coin, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So maybe to close, suppose someone's watching this and they're like, this is great work. Also, it kind of sucks in the following ways. I want to make it better. What should they be uh, noticing sucks and what should they do about it? Oh, awesome question. I.e., what's a good future work? Yeah. But phrase so more saucy. What? Yeah. What? No, no, no. Saucy. Yeah. What sucks about this method? I mean, look how simple these high level models are. I mean, in my like mm. vision, in my dream is like you articulate an arbitrary sort of algorithm at the high level that might include loops and interesting control structures and hierarchical structure. Transformers and, don't have loops, man. Yeah, whatever. I don't. I, 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 Chain of thought is the only thing remotely like a loop. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of whether you, you could consider the ability of an attention head to kind of look arbitrary indefinite distances as having some sort of loop-like property nah. to it. 
That's not a uh, loop. That's not a loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like, anyways, yeah. It could do yeah, like so a that's reduction. the vision though, right? Yeah, yeah. Is just having crazy stuff happen at the high level and that like, you know, in the dream, you have a multimodal model embedded in like, that is getting like, sight and text and whatever and it's constructing a world model inside and that the idea of a world model is like this very deeply kind of algorithmic causal object where it's like this representation of the world the model can run forward and run backwards and do its own edits too so it's a yeah i just feel like essentially so many of the methods right now are just you know mostly proof of concept experiments for the methodologies themselves. And so basically, I just agree so much with you that there's so much low hanging fruit around, like go to our GitHub and you could just like literally start using this tool to uncover whatever b- variables are interesting to you because of why you care about uh, interpreting a model, I guess. So, I mean, yeah, a concrete thing that I'd love to see is someone just takes this, takes DPT too small tries doing this for indirect identification and sees if they can extract things from the residual stream. Mm -hmm. Since that work mostly looks at heads. I think that is another direction is just unifying the work, uh, this work on the residual stream and the work on attention heads, because it feels Mm. like those two pieces should come together into Mm. like a borderline full picture of the transformer, at least on whatever relevant subdomains we're looking at it on. That also would be super interesting because it seems like there should be some kind of name subspace that could be recovered. Or, well, so there's something interesting about the indirect object identification task where the model is both doing, um, it's both tracking the position of the duplicated name and the value of the duplicated name. Mm. Which, now I think about it, the position is just obviously vastly easier because that's a binary variable while name is like an enormous variable, but it kind of tracks both. So that's actually something I was thinking is interesting with the interpretability in the wild case exactly, which is when we were thinking about how much space you need to store these variables, that yeah, like a name variable needs a lot of space, right? I mean, like you might think it has to support up to thousands of potential, like, or thousands of features are highly correlated with one one another and need to have an orthogonal decomposition in some Mm -hmm. way. And so- yeah. Yeah, I think that's completely right. Like, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess there's like a kind of, there's a shared name direction, but then if you delete that, they'll Mm -hmm. be kind of orthogonal-ish. I don't know. One of the things which is messy about linear representations is there's so many Mm. shared features, like Mary and Jesus will share a, like, Christianity direction, Mm. even if there'll also be an I am Mary and an I am Jesus, like, name direction. Mm -hmm. Or, like... Mark yeah. John Luke Paul will share an apostle's direction, and some of them will share a Beatles direction, and mm-hmm. and no, yeah, it's actually related to some experiments I've been doing with an undergrad where we're working on a gender bias data set with profession data, and there's the question of being able to identify, sort of like you you just uh, state that a doctor exists, and then you make the you put the language model in a situation where it has to assign a gender to that person. Mm. And there's a question of how do we minimally identify the neurons mediating sort of the gender bias of a doctor and remove those or alter those while maintaining the neurons encoding other things about being a doctor, like doing surgery or whatever. And you don't want to change the, like remove the gender bias neurons, but then accidentally turn them into a car mechanic or like a taxi cab driver or something like that. Checks out. Anyway, uh, randomly throwing out other things I'd love to see. Um, Mm -hmm. I like really want to see someone try to figure out how this interacts with superposition. And things I that go into this, that, honestly. So that might. Be I mean, the this sounds. Thing I start thinking about. Yeah, it sounds. I would really love fun. to see that. And I don't know it sounds kind of hard, but also seems like fucking badass. In particular, I want to see if this. Well, first off, can you at all relax the thing where these variables are orthogonal to each other is important, and like what would that even look like? What other stuff is sharing these spaces? Mm-hmm. Another thing would be. Just trying to get the number of directions as low as you possibly can. Like, I think my idea of give each its own interval so it's easy to throw a vector out would help. And then, like, add some regularization to penalize it for having high B. 
which you can mm -hmm. also anneal as you lower beta. Like you encourage it to make this smaller. Uh, you could also take the like trained like representation lens and then retrain it to be sm a like small orthogonal subset of the thing it came out. Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have done some experiments. Oh, does that work? Similar to that. So we didn't do that experiment. But exactly, we did it to learn the sort of decomposition, like looking for, mm -hmm. so given one set of dimensions, trying to find the two subsets of that set, one that encode each input for the hierarchical mm -hmm. equality task. But yeah, no, that's a really good question, whether just applying that process iteratively would just find a smaller and better alignment. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, and like here, greater than less than feels like it should be a direction, or at least Agreed. like... Yeah, yeah, two to three directions tops if it decomposes into smaller features. Like, I could totally imagine a leading digit bigger, uh, leading digit equal, and second leading digit bigger mm -hmm. kind of vibe. Or something like yeah. that. And then I'm, but I'm also wondering, like, do these things just have so many dimensions they just don't even care and they just don't even want, like, they can just have this information spread out? Ah, ah, but so my argument is that if there are multiple directions that have the same information, and that information is binary, you just take the average of those dimensions when it's on, minus the average when it's on. Uh, yeah, okay, we're... And that's just a single Oh, direction. that's a pretty good argument. That's a pretty good argument. And this also that works is... if the variable is continuous and they can be non-linear functions. Uh -huh. And it doesn't work when the variable can decompose into a bunch of other variables that can, like... Yep. Yep. vary while still making it up like the leading digits and like second leading digits thing that's like, a good question a pretty then good argument this is a no i i think i did not understand it the first time you said it because that is a very strong argument in the case of binary <laughs> variables where it basically as far as i can tell so far in my head seems like that's just like a mathematical proof of their existing <laughs> a canonical dimension Yes. Just to walk through the argument uh, for viewers who didn't have Atticus a splash of insight, the argument is, we think there's some direction in the residual stream representing, say, Z is greater than X or not. You can imagine just taking everything where this is on, taking the average of that, take everything where this is false, take the average of that, and the difference, and this just like should be the direction. And you can imagine that the model is like, using a bunch of other stuff in a weird and nonlinear way or something. But just just that should be a direction. Well, that's a, just uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Well I, you know, I guess the last uh, thing, you know, anyone who does math, you should do causal abstraction. It's a pretty fun area. Ah. Cool stuff. Uh you know there's you lots mean of you should go comprehensible papers. You you surely mean you should go and think through how to think about superposition. Yes, that's that's what I meant. That's, that's yes. what I was trying to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Must have had a stroke or something. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> yes. And no. Run other things in my stack of interesting stuff. Get this as slow as possible. Um, get do this on like head outputs or like yes, yes. These queries and values in a head or like neurons or MLP layer outputs or something like. And no, that would feel super cool to me. Yes, that's a uh, Zen is really excited about doing that as like a follow up thing. I think he might be literally working on that as we speak. Ooh, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. And just like on that general vibe, I'm like, yeah, do that. that. Sounds fabulous. Also, you probably want to be, yeah, you, you need to identify like the right heads and the right neurons. Uh, doing this for just like subspaces corresponding to like features like name or state or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like this state this town is the capital of this state or something and like look for the country subspace or the or the capital yeah. subspace or something and like see like concretely test the hypothesis that countries should be basically orthogonal within the subspace mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. control for the country directions and like this will not be true because there's going to be lots of correlation. But if you can find the like causal I am France direction, is mm -hmm. this orthogonal to the causal I am Britain direction? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I sure hope they're orthogonal, but yeah, yeah. So funny and related. Uh, 
to that idea is so what if you had these two sort of like correlational clusters of features that use some of the same dimensions i wonder if that could in some way guide you towards interesting model failures like where it's like oh like say like u.s presidents and like ice cream flavors they have some interference mm. then perhaps perhaps saying like my favorite ice cream is pistachio maybe rocky road second who was the fifth president you know it it, out, it outputs like almond praline or something right and, and you know it just like for some reason like uh you know, it, there just happens to be random interference between these seemingly unrelated semantic language phenomena, but that if you actually look into the superposition story, it could tell you something about why that mm. interference was occurring. A vibe. In this concrete situation, I like vibe a little bit less because uh -huh. the ice cream flavors and the presidents should be in different residual streams. So you need some story of how they end up in the same residual stream. I agree. So, my like, example was not inspiring. <laughs> yes. Your examples are always inspiring, but it could be better. Um, thank you. Thank you. Anyway. Appreciate it. All right. We should probably wrap up here. Thanks a lot for joining me. I learned much. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, you should check these all out in the description.